Uh, our next speaker is Captain Stephen Zoltan Kelaty. Uh, he is the Scripps Institution of Oceanography Marine Superintendent uh, for Vessels and Marine Facilities. The title of his talk is Green Light for Sustainability. Uh, Zoltan Kelaty is approaching his seventh year as the Marine Superintendent at uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, University of California, San Diego, where he manages the research vessels Roger Revelle and the Robert Gordon Sproul Research Platform FLIP, the new construction activities of research vessel Sally Ride, and the transfer of research vessel Melville to the Philippine Navy. Uh, Zoltan graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy and is a 28-year veteran of the United States Navy, retiring in 2008 with the rank of captain. He served on four nuclear-powered attack and ballistic missile submarines and commanded the world's deepest diving submarine. He is certified as Chief Engineer of Nuclear Power Plant Operations by the U.S. Department of Energy. He additionally served as Director of the U.S. Navy's Arctic Submarine Laboratory and completed a submerged winter Atlantic to Pacific crossing of the Arctic Ocean passing beneath the North Pole. Part of what I'll discuss today involves the fact that we replaced our fear. Uh, we're very, very fortunate. Uh, six acres site, not co located in Sequoia, but we're on the bay side, which is far better for the ships. Our pier was built in 1965 and 1973, funding from both the Science Foundation and Office of Naval Research. Structure and about this 50th year, finally gave up the So, we've been spending the last two years rebuilding our pier. I've also had the great fortune of all the new construction activities at South Drive. And while very smartly I was not actually asked to speak on the day, I actually had an opportunity to speak one on one with the ship's sponsor and her family. So, Pam O'Shaughnessy was Sally Drive's. And as well, a wonderful woman, Reverend Bear Bride, also attended the ceremony. And if you have a name like Bear, you better be able to rumble with the sailor and uh, she a lot of fun. So, in addressing them, I pointed out the fact that I felt horrible in that I was unable to correct a critical error that was made by you. That for a hundred thousand years, been an error made and nobody's fixed it. Nobody's attempted to fix it. As soon as we had hominids that could walk the earth, they touched the ground, they gave them the earth. And they saw this thing that was salty lake. They walked up to it. At times they took fish out of it, at times they were eaten by the fish. And they called that ocean. And yet, a hundred thousand years later, while we expanded our knowledge of this while well, we had Phoenicians that sailed on the waters, the Vikings sailed on the waters, eventually the Brits, so tired of their poor food, sailed the world in search of spices, we discovered the fact that we had a planet that was 70% water. Neil Armstrong himself, who later would have a beautiful research vessel named that, stepped foot on our moon, looked back, and saw a blue planet. I'm not on? No, not. Can anybody hear me? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. It's a live stream. We need it. Uh, let's let's turn me on, though. Yeah. You know where that is? Yeah. It's, it's in my pocket. I apologize for that. Yeah. It's on. We can there you go. Great. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> for the live stream. <laughs> so, Neil Armstrong looks back. He sees a blue planet. All of our outer space neighbors see a blue planet, and yet we still call this place Earth. Positively, every mariner in this room and CIFAR should campaign at this point to change. We are now planet ocean. The Earth is only 30%. We are 70% of the globe. We need to change that immediately. So, if you consider that CIFARs were the first people that acted locally, they had their ships, they had control of their ships, but they thought globally, 
Seafarers were the first people to have sustainability in mind. They thought globally, but they acted locally. So next, please. So in my beautiful spot down on Point Loma, I have many neighbors. Um, this was an example of one such neighbor, the gray whale. The gray whale is certainly a global thinker. The gray whale is, has the record for the longest migration by a mammal ever. And one particular female gray whale left Siberia and came to Baja, California and returned with a calf, a round trip of 14,000 miles, did it in 173 days, basically swimming three and a half miles an hour continuously. How does this affect us? Well, during a period of time that we built our pier, fortunately this whale did not show up because this would have completely shut down our efforts to build a pier. We actually have a watch for marine mammals. We would shut down in-water work. So us at Scripps, thinking locally, treating our neighbors well, one to have actually appreciated this. Uh, we know also that this was a male whale because he was lost for a month, but yet did not ask directions from anybody. So <laughs> next, please. Um, we also, in San Diego, have a very, very small population of endangered sea turtles. There's approximately 50 to 80 of these. Um, the sea turtles come for the eelgrass that grows within San Diego Bay. Uh, this animal, pretty large in size, is entirely a herbivore. It eats entirely eelgrass and algae. Uh, we had, in the eastern portion of our bay, a nuclear, or not a nuclear power plant, a conventional power plant, and the effluent, this particular turtle thinks is a spa, and it really enjoyed it. For 50 years, it enjoyed the effluent, and then the power plant went away, which then caused this turtle population to disperse. It hasn't left the bay, but now our biologists can no longer do an easy count. So we still believe there's between 50 to 80. This was part of our daily routine. At every morning when sun came up, we would start our turtle watch. Um, we never did get to see one, really disappointment for me, but this again, Acting locally, we would have shut down our, our operations in building a new pier for the sea turtle. Next, please. Um, you may be aware that we have a least turn population in San Diego County. We have about 60% of all the least turn. Um, they basically have a range from northern Baja California to San Francisco. And as you can see, uh, we mankind almost killed off this animal. We were down to 500 breeding pairs in the 1970s efforts. Uh, throughout San Diego County and throughout California and Mexico have resulted in almost 10 times increasing their population. This particular animal uh, does cause us significant amount of change to our schedule in building a pier. You do absolutely no in-water work during the breeding season. So from one September through, from one April through one September of the year, no in-water work is permissible when building a pier. So, we scheduled our entire efforts around the least turn. Um, I gave my brief to my sons. Um, I have twin 17-year-old sons. They said, at this point, Dad, you could say you might want to make sausage out of this animal because then you could take a turn for the worst. And I said, no, no, we're not doing that. So, so next, please. All right, and then we also have terrestrial neighbors that we deal with. Um, we happen to sit in a very, very envious portion of San Diego Bay. Our neighbors to the north are referred to as La Playa, the beach, very, very well named. And um, this beach, the, uh, the newspapers indicated it's a wonderful hidden beach. As you can see, it's actually within a stone's throw of my office. And uh, these neighbors are, unlike the other neighbors I deal with, are much more vocal when I happen to offend them. So, we uh, made tremendous efforts in our pier build to avoid noise pollution, light pollution. Um, we had measuring systems. Um, the one house you can't actually see, it's a little bit low, was the only house that actually had vibration from the pile driving. So we um, actually purchased a hotel room for them and they could leave their house at any time um, so that they could avoid the feeling of pile driving. Should you wish to become my neighbor, Right there by the B, um, you'll see a pier and a house, and that house is for sale for the low price of $14.5 million. So I wish you two to be next. Next. All right. Our um, UC president, Janet Napolitano, committed the University of California to being carbon neutral by 2025. 
Um, in doing so, she has already spent $250 million as the first step towards that program. Um, in the 1970s, there was actually a horrible song by um, a woman named Melanie that was, I have a brand new pair of roller skates, you have a brand new key. In this case, Janet Napolitano had money for renewable energy and I had an enormous flat roof. So we are the beneficiaries of one of five projects at the University of California, San Diego. The very best news is, this is actually tied into my metering system. So I have almost a zero electric bill and this benefits scientists because um, eventually my shore costs are picked up by science at sea. So I can make science at sea cheaper by having fewer shore costs. Uh, some interesting things about this. Um, thus far, we're the equivalent of 188 acres of pine forest. Um, I called up the solar company and it offered to exchange back, but they would not give me the pine forest in exchange. Um, we've also carried the power equivalent to um, one year of 5,000 computers being worked, or you could watch 516 years of television for the amount of power that we've produced, but you would have to watch a significant amount of reruns for that. Next, please. Um, and in doing so, when we rebuilt the pier, we doubled the amount of shore power available to any individual bunker. You may have already heard that at times, ships have to start um, a diesel engine in port just to start a winch or a crane. So no more at Scripps, that will not happen. Next, please. Um, part of our solar farm, we also got an uh, electric car charging station. Um, I've not yet seen anyone use it, but if you were to drive either a Volt or a Leaf, um, within the amount of time that you're working at my office, you could recharge your car. Uh, apparently level two means it's at the 240 volt level. Uh, you basically double all your charging times if you have a level one charging station, which many people might in their homes. Next, please. Um, you get an awful lot of credit by using electric machinery over diesel driven machinery. We have two electric forklifts, and so we pick up some points in this general system of establishing what you can do and what you can't do. And then a major problem, not really addressed much by this group, is the concept of stormwater. Um, if you consider that Phoenix, Arizona gets about 30 inches of rain a year, and San Diego gets six inches of rain a year, we average nine, but over the last 10 years, about six, that you would think that stormwater runoff would not be a problem. But all these constituents that you see here just build up. So anybody that's from Southern California can tell you as soon as we have 15 minutes of rain, we have 100 auto accidents because all of the petroleum products that have leaked onto highways become liquid and then parts slip all over. Pretty good plume just coming off of Point Loma during an average rainfall. So how did we act locally in regard to this? You can see on the next slide is that we now have a zero runoff site. Not just the pier, but our entire site is, is zero runoff. Um, the old pier did not look like this. We have a significant bunker around the entire pier and a very, very long drain system. So the finger pier, which extends out into the, into the bay, as well as the fact that the marginal wharf all drains to this system. And then, next please, we can do a couple different things with the water. Um, certain hours of the day I can pump it back to the city of San Diego and let them treat it. Um, I can also allow some of it to go through these BioClean modular wetlands. Um, next one is a trade slide from BioClean, please. And uh, these particular wetlands will do things like 95% of motor oil introduced into this, only 5% comes out on the other end. So that's a pretty good cleaning system. Uh, zinc is 70% declined by this. Uh, copper is 50%, and uh, phosphates, we don't have a lot of phosphate problem, we don't, we're not fertilizing anything, but the phosphates are in the 70% range. But right now, the, for the small amount of rain we've had since this, I just pump it all to the city and then they have to take care of it. Um, as part of our efforts for best management practices, we try to make sure that, that no amount of accumulation is occurring so that when we do have runoff, there's no opportunity. Um, so a nice outgrowth, outgrowth of this is I didn't have to pay for it, but I received a bunch of tarps to cover all of our wire. So our wire that is for the UNOS fleet is better treated. Um, 
even things like garbage dumpsters, um, the thought is that rainwater hitting a dumpster could cause some metal concentration to hit the ground. So we, so basically, it's pretty ugly, but everything is covered with a tarp in my boneyard. Um, we formally had our hazardous material shed on the pier apron, and it didn't really make much sense there. So with just a little bit of thought, um, the contractor came to us and said, hey, this is in the way. Do you mind if we knock it down? We'll rebuild it. And we said, OK. And unbeknownst to them, we intended to have it rebuilt here anyhow. So part of our peer process was we got our hazmat material shed moved far away from the water, which makes more sense should you ever actually have a problem. And then you may have heard uh, from several different people, um, we had a program to run our smallest ship for a two-year period on biofuel. Um, unlike the other programs you've heard to date, this was B100. So we had 100% biofuel. Um, I felt OK doing it. Sproul is honestly an old ship, 35 years. There's no warranty on the engines. But we had no problems that you might have experienced with this. Um, next slide, please. So we had a, a very, very fine scientist, Dr. Lynn Russell, who set up monitoring. She did intensive monitoring for a period of two months. Um, with uh, piggybacking with other scientists at sea, and then left her gear in place, and we monitored for a two-year period. Um, you can see some things that uh, biofuel has about 4% less BTUs than marine gas oil, so the ship actually goes a little bit slower. Um, but one in interesting thing is the total cost is about 10% greater. Um, our biofuel stock, unfortunately, came from Singapore, so if you took into account the total carbon footprint you have to take into account moving the biofuel to America, and so that blows the deal for you. So um, part of Janet Napolitano's efforts to become carbon neutral is University of California has taken on to become its own developer of biogas. So we will eventually one day be a supplier to the University of California for biogas, hopefully including biodiesel. Um, she listed the fleet vehicles as part of the goal. I'm going to try to convince her that vehicles includes the UNOL's fleet and uh, within the carbon neutrality. But when you look at 10%, we have now used up every last ounce of our MRAD purchased biofuel. And um, the big boss came to me and said, what now? And I said, well, I have to run the cheapest fleet I can because science is he should be done as cheaply as possible. So he went back to the administration and said, for 10% more, we can continue to run our ships as green as possible. So we are in the act of browbeating our um, donors to only pay for the differential between marine gas oil and biofuel, and we feel confident that we can find a donor to do this. And then finally, um, you can see some of the effects, and a good news story um, you've already, you're already well aware of the fact that you can lower your carbon footprint through biodiesel. But take a look at the engine RPMs, and you'll see at low RPMs, there's a tremendous difference. Because um, at high RPMs, you have near complete combustion anyhow. Low RPMs, which is the regime that most research vessels operate in, is where you get the greatest bang for your buck by running biodiesel. So we accidentally discovered that Biodiesel has an extra flair for, you, for research vessels in that we're rarely running around 100% load, so you get the, the greatest amount of improvement in the environment for the least cost. And subject to your questions, oh, never forget this. These are the very important people that provide money for research at sea and including our biodiesel program. Um, my boss wanted to also point out the UC ship funds um, supported this, so we take actual UC funds for, for science at sea, as well as the Office of Naval Research, NSF, and MARAD itself, which contributed the quarter million dollars to, to our program. And that's one more. And subject to your questions, um, the three uh, people that represent the UNOS fleet would be very happy to answer your questions. Or. Thank you, Zoltan.